Save a Rose, as well as another coalition of birth workers and activists. There's no excuse for medical racism. No excuse. At all. No excuse. We need to make sure that everyone is being seen and everyone is being heard the first time. Yes. yes. Martin Luther King once said, Justice long awaited is justice unserved. I'm tired of people of political power making decisions for us when they've never lived our lives. Mm -hmm. Amber Rose Isaac believed that by saving the children is how we save our future. She wanted to provide extracurricular activities for those children so they can see more to New York, the Bronx, Harlem. She wanted to help the underserved communities because those people are our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, friends. Those are our people, our community. Uh, my name is Bruce McIntyre, B-R-U-C-E-M-C-I-N-T-Y-R-E, -E, the third. And I am the founder of the Save Rose Foundation, which is uh, named after Amber Rose Isaac and it is in her honor. Um, so what we do at the Save Rose Foundation is we combat and dismantle the systemic flaws within the medical system. And we're trying to redirect the course of birthing equity towards uh, better birthing solutions. Around this time, two years ago, um, Amber Rose Isaac transitioned. She passed away uh, giving birth to my son from uh, an unscheduled emergency C-section that stemmed from medical negligence throughout her entire pregnancy. I jumped into this advocacy work almost immediately, actually. She advocated for women and she knew more about maternal health than I did. She knew more about midwives and doulas, which I was still kind of being introduced to, but I knew how to advocate. I was advocating for black lives and um, human rights, civil rights. I, I just remember leaving the hospital and just like in shock that um, she's not coming home with me. When I got home, I, I couldn't sleep going into an empty room, an empty bed, and that your life is completely altered. I started a GoFundMe in her honor because we had to pay for unexpected funeral expenses, which was a lot. You know, it just got to the point where I needed help from the community. A couple of days before she passed away, she wanted to uh, to write a tell-all about the incompetence, the negligence that she had been dealing with from the medical system. I felt like I needed to finish that for her. The Argo Fund Me went viral. We raised enough money for her funeral expenses. The leftover money, I, I thought, you know, I really need to honor her and, and make sure that this isn't happening to other fathers, other children, mothers, it's such a hard feeling to really get over. And that's not something that I wanted for other families. It got to the point where I'd done so much advocacy work that people were really paying attention to what I was saying. And they really started to look into the maternal health crisis. I started speaking to, you know, people in London, you know, all throughout the UK, in Paris, um, Uganda, Africa. Thailand, India, so many places I started advocating for these families because we started to realize this is going on to women of color around the world. I've been advocating for uh, freestanding midwifery led birthing centers. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, the Bronx is to have one. So right now we're in the process of, of opening our birthing center. We have the uh, Amber Rose Isaac Access to Home Birth Scholarship Program that offsets the cost of insurance premiums. Since May in 2020, we've been able to help over 60 families. Um, have home births and, and birthing center births. And you know, over 50% of the, uh, the cesareans being done in these hospitals aren't necessary. They're making about 50% more than what they would for a natural birth. There's been this, this bias uh, agenda that's been infiltrating and uh, violating our human and civil rights for a very long time. You know, the hospital didn't do whatever they, they could to, to make sure that my mental health was intact. Um, instead, they were, you know, trying to throw drugs at me, like Xanax and other powerful antidepressants. And I'm thinking to myself, well, how am I supposed to take care of my newborn child who just lost his mother if I'm doped up on drugs and I'm left incompetent to take care of him? I truly believe the model of care that the midwives and doulas have, where they're taking care of you before, during, after pregnancy, and throughout postpartum. Um, I feel like that's very important to uh, sustain mental health. I mean, I don't even know how you can cope with what you've been through. Amber, Amber. It took really Amber to teach me how to love myself, 
Um, she was also a psychology major. She was uh, set to earn her master's actually um, around the same time Elias was born. So she was supposed to walk on stage and receive her master's degree. Um, we can honor Amber by, by making sure that this isn't happening to anyone else um, and that we're stepping in as a community because that's what we need. How long have you been coming to Grand Fish Oval? Um, since the first event actually, I wanted to make my presence known over here. Um, so I, I held a, a, a Mother's a Mother's Day rally over here, and it's a beautiful space. It's a beautiful park. It's a monumental park. There's just so much advocacy work do, uh, that gets done in this park, um, and I felt like it was special to us. And it's right down the street from where she was being elected, um, and you know, it's just it's just a beautiful place. And I felt I, I was called to be here. You know, parks are, are very important to us, and being around scenery and nature and beauty. Um, and, and just enjoying the sun. I, I felt like this was a great park to, to really bring people together, you know, and I, I feel like we get so much love over here. And... Only an idea back in 2003. Today, local leaders and community members broke ground on the new Williams Bridge Oval Skate Park. The plans got rolling when skaters brought up the idea to Councilman Andy Cohen in 2014. So more than any other park in the city, Williams Bridge Oval is something for everyone, from bocce to soccer, to tennis, to basketball, to play for kids, and now skateboarding. We want to thank, I want to make sure I pronounce his name properly, Eusebio Baez. He's a local skateboarder that actually helped influence the design. I've never skateboarded, but I've watched him, so thank you so much for helping out the design. I'm Eusebio Baez. Uh, my relationship to uh, Oval is I was one of the locals who help design the skate park. It was your idea for to have a skate park created? It was this guy named Doug. So we used to always skate on the opposite side of the park where people would jog and walk their dogs and, be, and the neighbors used to get upset because they can hear the boards all the time. So Doug, who was like a local advocate for the community, pitched it to the board and then he got all the skaters involved. We had about like three different meetings where we shared ideas. And I had no prior experience. Uh, I've been a skateboarder almost my whole life. So it was just a collective thing where all me and my friends, uh, we had the opportunity to actually design a skate park. Uh, and we just put all our ideas together. So by the third meeting, they had renders. We we're like, wait, time out, this is really cool. We never really thought that our ideas would be actually put into consideration, you know? The meeting after that, it was really everything that we wanted in the skate park was on that sheet of paper, on that blueprint. When the skate park was being built, it was very exciting because it was like something we actually designed being made, especially in our neighborhood. But throughout the process, we kept seeing that not only was it delayed, but they were building this, the obstacles the wrong way. What sucked was that the contractor that they contracted for this had no prior experience building skate parks. It got to the point where they built the skate park and a lot, a lot of features were built incorrect where they had to take it down. They laid down the concrete and the same day it rained and they didn't cover it. So the next day it was completely flooded. So they had to just break it down and start all over. And then we see it being built again and we're like uh, super stoked on it again and then we noticed that every hub over to the downlet had a kink at the bottom so it's just a lot of things like that and if it rains right now it's completely flooded like you can't skate it it's like hey if you're gonna invest in a project you want to make sure the contractors that are in charge of making this project come to life are experienced in that field. A park should be built by contractors that have experience in this, because a lot of money was wasted here that could have been implemented in other sources of the community. I feel like the intentions were correct, just the execution was, wasn't good, you know? But it does feel good to have something in the Bronx, in your local neighborhood, that you actually helped, and you contributed, and made it happen. What is your favorite part about the Oval? This park has everything. Um, and the people, man, the people here are awesome. You know, you have people from all over, all different backgrounds, and they all come to this park to, to have fun. Whatever happens outside the park, leaves once you enter the park, you know. Sometimes when you're out here, you might think about other things that are happening in the community, racial profiling, or this, this and that. But when you come out here, everyone's here for a good time. All that gets left behind the park. It's like a sanctuary, you know.
take a look. It literally looks more like a pool than a skate park. Before we went on, there's just two kids over here. I'm going to have you pan over and just show the two kids literally swimming in this. The skateboarders are telling us that specifically water is really bad for their boards. It water logs their wheels and can cause a lot of damage. And many of them who use this park regularly are saying they hope that this water goes away soon. My name is Lloyd Altan. I am the Bronx Borough Historian. Can you talk about the culture in the Bronx prior to the arrival of Europeans? It like yeah, it, the land uh, that is now the Bronx was largely covered in forest, rather dense forest. Through those forest lands, there would be little footpaths, narrow footpaths, that would be what would later be called Indian trails. Some of those have been widened uh, later on after the Europeans had arrived, and a number of them are now city streets. Most of the villages were on the water's edge uh, because water provided the main transportation with canoes and also provided uh, some fish. Water played a very important part. It was the main means of transportation. Uh, their canoes went anywhere. If you have fresh water, part of the water supply that enabled the entire village to exist. We used the trails uh, basically to get from place to place, but also to do some hunting and uh, perhaps uh, gathering nuts and berries. Who were the native people? There is some controversy these days in exactly how you would describe them. We do know that they all had the same kind of culture, which is the woodland culture. They lived in uh, wigwams and uh, did fishing and hunting. And the young uh, boys and girls would be uh, trying to imitate what the elders were doing in their play, and that would prepare them for their, uh, their adult lives. Today, it is generally accepted that the entire area in and around uh, New York City and the Bronx, and to a considerable extent in upstate New York, was part of the larger grouping of uh, Indians called the Muncies. The main focus of attention and of self-government among the uh, American Indians in the area was the local village. And it was the chief of the local village, or the Sakam, uh, held sway, and he had to persuade people uh, to do things. He couldn't just give them orders. The first uh, European settler was a fellow by the name of Jonas Bronck, and he was born in Sweden. He married a Dutch girl, and he brought with him several indentured servants. Basically, what they did was they cut down some of the trees, and they planted uh, in the cleared land, and they started farming. Most of the land remained the same with the very early settlers, but whenever settlers arrived, one of the first things they did was to cut down the trees. Jonas Bronck, when he died, gave his name to one of the boundaries of his land, uh, the Bronx River. It was Bronx's River, B-R-O-N-C-K apostrophe S. Uh, try writing that with a quill pen. It's a little difficult, so they abbreviated it B-R-O-N-X. Now, the Bronx was originally part of Westchester County and was the next to New York City in two separate stages. The western half in 1874, the eastern half in 1895, and in 1898, the uh, city of next Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island, and set up a borough system, they decided that the air, two areas previously annexed should also become a borough, but they didn't know what to call it since it never had a name before. They looked at a map, and right smack in the middle of this territory ran the Bronx River, and thus we have the borough of the Bronx. And not just plain Bronx, because it's named after the river. After the Revolutionary War, the area was all farmland. In the 19th century, railroads started to come in. The area became a little bit more suburban, still largely rural. Industry started coming in in the second half of the 19th century, and uh, urbanization really grew apace from the 1890s onward. So throughout the 19th century, the whole landscape changed from uh, forest to rural to suburban to urban, which it is today. The area that is today called the Norwood neighborhood of the Bronx was originally called, believe it or not, Williams Bridge because it was close to an old colonial bridge over the Bronx River at Gun Hill Road near the farm of John Williams. 
The Williams Bridge Reservoir was originally built in 1888, and it was just a, an earthen system that held water from the Kensico system, uh, which was the second water system and the water supply uh, for the city of New York. Uh, the Croton was the first. They dammed up the headwaters of the Bronx River, uh, and that uh, formed the Kensico water supply. Uh, the Williams Bridge uh, Reservoir was meant to be a holding reservoir to hold water for distribution uh, later on. The reservoir closed uh, in, in around the early 1930s. Then it was developed uh, by Robert Moses, the first uh, New York City Parks Commissioner, uh, into a uh, uh, park and he emphasized the playground part of the park uh, more than the uh, resting areas. Uh, he was always interested in, uh, in using parks for active sports and recreation. It was farmland uh, before becoming a reservoir. Uh, the farm uh, that it was on immediately was uh, the farm of uh, Isaac Varian. Over the years, the uh, Varian sold off uh, some of the property. The reservoir itself uh, was built on their property, but the, uh, the house that uh, Isaac Varian and his family lived in is still standing right here at the exit of the park, called the Valentine Varian. House. That house is uh, now owned uh, by the Bronx County Historical Society and is run as the Museum of Bronx History. How long have you been coming to the Williams Bridge Oval? Well, only since the, uh, basically since the 1960s. As part of the uh, campaign to preserve the Valentine Varian House from destruction. Uh, my name is Raj McCormack. I'm the Director of Education here at the Bronx County Historical Society. Uh, which owns this historic uh, site, the Valentine Varian House. Here we are at the Valentine Varian House, also the Museum of Bronx History, the second oldest house in the Bronx. Uh, it's built in 1758. It's named for the two farmers that lived in the house and, and farmed the land here. Um, first, the farmer was Isaac Valentine. He was a blacksmith as well as a farmer. He uh, built the house uh, using stone. You can come in here and see the windows. Uh, using field stone that he had, he had taken out of his he had taken out of his field. And slavery, of course, isn't abolished in New York uh, until 1827. So Isaac Valentine owned slaves, and the house was built in part by slave labor. He doesn't fight in the revolution, and he just kind of works the land here and tries to make it, you know, work despite these really um, terrible circumstances of the war. And the house is, is used as headquarters a few times. Rochambeau, the French general, commander of the French forces in America, um, sleeps here uh, during the Grand Reconnaissance in 1781. And he referred to the house as a wretched farmhouse. But after the war, Isaac Valentine loses the farm and goes into debt. And then Isaac Varian um, takes it over. And Isaac Varian is a butcher and a farmer. And he farms the land here for uh, almost 100 years. And then the Bronx is rapidly urbanizing. From 1900 to 1930, um, population increases from like 200,000 to over a million. It's extraordinary. Um, this huge burst of population. So the house, you know, this 18th century farmhouse in this kind of rapidly urbanizing environment, it was uh, owned by William Beller, who was a lawyer and interested in historic preservation. And the idea was that. You would move the house and have it here because this was parkland, part of the New York City Parks Department, and that would preserve it. So if you look out the window here, the house, the apartment building on the corner, the house was moved from that location in 1965. It was in fairly good condition when it was moved. Um, unfortunately, it sits, no one lives there for three years until 1968 when it's opened as a museum by the Bronx County Historical Society. Um, it's a wonderful uh, historic house and it's it's a testament also to the Bronx. It's a huge amount of green space. So one fourth of the Bronx is parkland. And change over time, of course, is uh, very significant for the historical society. And we, we have exhibits on much more recent history as well, uh, which are embodied in the Bronx Latino History Project and the Bronx African American History Project. My name is Frank de Cruz, and I'm a neighbor. I moved. When I moved to the Bronx nine years ago, I was right there. 
When I look out my window, I see the Oval. And you write about the WPA. You have a website dedicated to like how the New Deal transformed parks right. in New York City. Yeah, well, that happened because of the Oval. First thing I did when I moved here is I came to the park and I looked around and I was really impressed by this park. You know, so it's it's like it's such a neighborhood resource. I mean, it, this is like it makes this neighborhood kind of like a village. Everybody comes to the park. You know, you come here. You find your friends, you know, it's like the meeting place for everybody in the neighborhood. The first thing I wondered was, how did it get here? And I found out, of course, that it was uh, the, the new, it's a New Deal project. This, this was a reservoir. Somebody decided it would, be a, it would make a nice park. Robert Moses, of course, takes total credit for it. Uh, and who knows? But who really knows? Robert Moses went to Fiorello LaGuardia, the mayor, who was Franklin Roosevelt's best buddy, he proposed uh, to make a park here. And, and that's what they did. The recreation center you see behind you, it's a beautiful building. There's no cornerstone. There's no place where it says who the architect was. It was Imar Embury Jr., New York's chief architect in the New Deal, who's responsible for over 600 constructions in the city, including the Triborough Bridge, um, you know, the, the tunnels under the Hudson, all kinds of buildings. He was the chief architect for the Parks Department, but he was paid by New Deal agencies. You can't see from this angle, but it's, it's, uh, it's curved like this. It's sort of like holding its arms out to welcome things. He used that same design in, in other places, Stanford Orchard Beach, the pavilion at Orchard Beach, which is kind of like this, except it's, it's huge. This is a New Deal project. How many other New Deal projects are there? So I started looking into it. I've identified over 1,000 New Deal projects in New York City. This was all taxpayer money and unemployed people in the Depression who would put the work with federal money to build stuff that was useful to people. Moses himself took personal credit for everything, when in fact it was designed, built, and paid for entirely by the New Deal. Well, Moses was a, a, a highly skilled administrator. You know, he got stuff done. He was mean, he was nasty. Uh, but he got people to do what he wanted. It's kind of interesting. The, so you see we're kind of sunk in a little bit from street level. From west to east, it's, it's a kind of an incline. But the park, the park needs to be flat. And in the act of raising it, they got, they got all this granite from the earth, and they made the recreation center. The granite. The granite from... that they dug up. They cut the stone. What's your favorite part about this park? I like that people are so nice here. People are so friendly. You know, all different nationalities, different religions. I've never seen another park like this. Uh, it's got everything, except the swimming pool. My name is Jennifer Tasig. I am the executive director of Mashaloo Preservation Corporation, MPC is the owner of this house. The house was built in 1889. It used to be a reservoir across the street before it was a park. And um, the person who lived in this house, um, it's called the Keeper's House because he was the groundskeeper for a very long time. He passed away, the house just was sort of left um, and abandoned. MPC uh, purchased it and rehabbed it, I believe in 1988. For MPC, we have um, four program areas that we focus on, which all um, address different barriers to the social determinants of health. We own some affordable housing um, in the neighborhood. We do what we call neighborhood development, which is like our cleaning and greening and sanitation, public art, community events work. 
And then we also have a, a small business support program area. Our last program area is we put out a, a hyper-local community newspaper called the Northern News. Our mission really, um, you know, is preserving neighborhoods and building community. And I feel like that's a nice sort of metaphor for what this house represents. You know, when I first got here, it was very much closed off to the community. It was really just being used for office space. And so we built, um, you know, right next to the house, um, a local edible community garden. It's done by Friends of Monshaloo Parkland, who's a hyper-local group here focused on um, sustainability. Um, and so when I was interviewing for the job, he gave me the tour of this house. And I was like, I'm not really sure what the job is you want me to do, but if you want me to do it in this house, particularly in my office, which is has a beautiful view of the reservoir and a view of the garden and this nice exposed brick. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do, the, I'll do whatever job you ask me to do if you want me to do it here. So I think for me, it like fills me with joy when I just see people out there using the park in so many different ways all at the same time. And they're all people that, that live right here in the neighborhood. There's not a lot of people traveling from outside to come to Williamsbridge Oval Park. So you can see there's like soccer practice going on at the same time as football practice, at the same time as track, at the same time as people skating and taking their dogs to the park and playing tennis and kids playing on the playground. Sometimes when I'm feeling like I need to get away from my computer for a minute and just feel a little stressed, I'll just go take a walk around the Oval too. And, um, it's really, it really is sort of a beautiful gem of the neighborhood. My name is Loretta Watson, and um, part of Friends of the Sugar Parkland. And my relationship is to the Oval is, it's my backyard. <laughs> I'm an advocate for parks in general, a particular advocate for this one. Friends of the Sugar Parkland, we call Pomp, really. Uh, we're at this park and PS8 and um, Wailing. And, a few different park, Prince uh, Charlie soon to be in the rest. My name is Elizabeth Guaranta. I'm the executive director of Friends of Marshallou Parkland. My connection to the Oval is actually Lorita. The Oval is just, as it's been a, a, a playground that has its very colorful history. The Friends of Marshallou took it under our wing because not everyone can commit the amount of hours that we have been committing to, so that's why Friends of Marshall Parkland ended up taking a few of the playgrounds in the area so that we can have equal services in all of the playgrounds. We have strong voices. We have good resources. We have eyes, eyes and ears. I think we can um, yeah. uh, we raise our, you know, uh, issues to the forefront that are most concerned to the community. We can say prior X for certain things to be prioritized. We even advocate for groups to come and do programming. So we've been here over 10 years, 20 years. So local groups are the voices of, of, of where they live. Um, so we have to speak out because it is our living room. Funding is an issue as always. Money is always an issue. Um, like I said, the park, uh, the skate park took 10 years and part of that was funding. Um, about the time we got the skate park uh, for the kids that were like Doug advocated for it originally. They're a new set of kids. They have kids, so um, that's where we are. So this place is what I think 26 acres. It's a huge park, so it's piece by piece. So that things happen. So once one piece get done, um, obviously another piece may get disarray. You fixing that one up, and you advocating for another piece of the park. It's well used. I think parks in general is well used. They don't get their fair share of funding in the city uh, at all. Besides funding, one of our big challenges is also the mission of agency and groups. So like Parks and Recreation, um, there, you know, where there's a back and forth with how they mow the lawn, how they do the weed whacking, you know, a lot of procedure that affects our everyday. So the relationship between the two, we don't necessarily see eye to eye when it comes to how the parkland land is, is kept and how the playground is kept. They always say the grass is greener on the other side. No, it ain't. It's greener because you water it. People need to know yeah. that you care and yeah. then they don't care. They're like, oh. That's why it's important to steward because yeah. we don't want communities to be transient. We want communities to have families for a long, a long time. Yeah. What role do parks like the Oval play in the community and why are they important?
It's an escape from escape the apartment. The apartment. That, that, that's this sure. is mostly an apartment community. You have a lot of apartments that get smaller and smaller. So the oval really provides that. I've had it. I got to get out. Feel, and and everything is here. You know, your neighbors are out here. It's weird. Some people start their day and end their day. You start yeah. your day for a walk before you go to work, and you end your day for a walk before you go to bed. What's your favorite part about the oval? Mine is the one. tunnel, believe it or not. <laughs> and I tell you why. You go through the tunnel and you enter. It's like a whole world. It's like that scene from The Wizard of Oz when she opens the house and she goes out into Munchkin Land. That's what I feel like when I go through the tunnel, coming into the tunnel. Right now, my latest is behind the recreation center. There's just this little grassy part where I can put out my little mat and book while the dogs chill. I just want to end off that people don't realize the power that they have. When the rules are no longer working and they actually affect our quality of life, then those rules that were created by people, they need to be changed by people as well. So people do have the power to change them for a longer, healthier life for not just our generation, but for the next one. I find the Bronx is diverse in many ways. It's diverse in its neighborhoods, in its architecture, uh, in its cultures. But most especially what I like about the Bronx is the people. Do I love the Bronx? You betcha. Please like, subscribe, comment, and share if you enjoyed this video.